Chapter 17, The Fountain of Children. Matt avoided Dr. Rivas and San Fuegos and went into the garden to think. He didn't even want to see Marisol. The rage that had threatened to overwhelm him faded, but it still frightened him. Why can't I control myself, he thought. Why can't I be good by merely saying, be good? But it didn't work that way. Maybe he should make a list of rules on a card to refer to. Rule number one, don't lose your temper. Rule number two, be courageous. Rule number three, send Marisol away. She would be miserable if he sent her away. It wasn't her fault that she was programmed to serve him. Besides, he really wanted to help her. Only not when Mar Maria was around. Rule four, don't tell lies. That was a toughie. Drug lords prospered by telling lies. Even Esperanza thought it was okay. Matt wandered deeper into the garden. A path led beneath a series of arbors, each one different, and each one with its own hummingbird feeder. Vines were hung with clusters of purple and green grapes. A giant squash dangled yellow fruit, and a third arbor was dotted with red roses. Then, most wonderful of all, Matt saw a mass of deep blue morning glories. Nothing at the Ajo Hacienda equaled this waterfall of flowers. There was a sound of coming from the far end of the arbor. A bird or a kitten? Matt listened more closely. Could it be the child he'd seen? It couldn't be an Egypt. They were unable to cry. He edged forward, not wanting to startle whoever it was. He saw the vines tremble. The person was inside the leaves, hiding in a burrow like a rabbit. Matt quietly approached and pulled back the vines. It was a little girl, an African girl. She was about Fidelito's age, but much thinner. Her arms were like the matchsticks clasped around her skinny chest, and just above one elbow was a vicious-looking wound, as though she'd been bitten by a dog. Don't be afraid, Matt said. The girl looked up and screamed. She bound up, she bounded out of the leaves and zigzagged through the garden. Stop, stop, I won't hurt you. Matt shouted. He tried to catch up, but she knew the garden, and he didn't. He followed what he thought was her trail and ended up in front of a wall. By now, he was exhausted. What with the after effects of the scarlet fever and the opening of the holoport, he leaned against the wall, breathing heavily. Few children came across the border, and none, as far as he could remember, had been black. This girl was no Egypt. She had to be someone's daughter, and if so, the person should have protected her from the animals. A dull rage kindled in Matt's head. How dare someone neglect such a frail child? Matt would find out who it was and punish him. For now, though, he was lost. He had chased the girl through the gardens and between the buildings until he lost sense of direction. It didn't matter. It was pleasant to be left alone in such a beautiful place. A fountain cast up a spray of water that flashed in the sun before raining back on the un upturned faces of statues of children. They held out their hands like real children, and the sculpture had given them expressions of joy, so lifelike that Matt smiled in sympathy. What a wonderful work of art, and how strange. Opium was no place for children. Matt wandered on, and presently he came to a sliding door. Inside he, f inside, he found a room full of large glass enclosures with no clear purpose. It might have been a zoo, except that the animals were missing. Long tables were covered with gleaming stainless steel pans and microscopes, and along one wall were giant freezers. Idly, he opened a heavy iron door, and a dense cloud of fog swirled out. He saw racks of bottles with tiny writing, McGregor number one to McGregor number th 13 in one rack. Dabengua number one to Dabengua number 19 in another. The bottles were dated. In a third rack, he found Mateo Alcaran, 
with one of the bottles, number 27, dated more than 14 years before. Matt slammed the door. He fled to one of the enclosures and pressed his face against the glass to calm his nerves. Those bottles were tissue samples. This was where he had been created. That date, 14, and a, and a half years earlier was his birthday, the day he was harvested from a cow. After a while, Matt's heartbeat slowed to, a nor to, to normal and he forced himself to look inside. Mechanical arms reached across the enclosure, the floor of which was a treadmill. Wisps of hay were trapped beneath, between the joints. Once a cow that had stood here and her legs had been flexed by the mechanical arms while the treadmill slowly ground forward. Someone had placed hay in her mouth while she chewed mindlessly, dreaming of the flowery meadows. I was going to give you a tour, but I see you've already found the lab, said Dr. Evas. He was standing in the open doorway and behind him was the fountain of children. You really should rest for a while, me patron. You aren't well yet. I want all the tissue samples destroyed, said Matt. That would destroy a hundred years of work. To a scientist, that's a mortal sin. I don't understand about sin, but I know evil when I see it, the boy said passionately. Cloning isn't the only thing that goes on here. The doctor pulled out a chair and sat down. The scientist made many discoveries about congenital diseases. Do you know about sickle cell anemia? They learned to grow healthy bone marrow in this lab to replace the diseased marrow of a victim. By using clones, I suppose, Matt said. At first, but by sacrificing a few, they saved thousands. They regenerated spinal tissue to heal paralysis. You see, this was the premier research lab in the world because we could experiment on humans. Well, almost humans. Matt struggled with the idea. The longer he was in opium, the more the line between good and evil blurred. Of course, it was a good to save people who, though no fault of their own, were suffering. You cut corners, made compromises, and soon you were in the same position as El Patron shooting down a passenger plane to avert a war. Where are those scientists now? Dr. Eva smiled sadly with El Patron. That's what I call a mortal sin, said Matt. He looked at the freezers lining the wall. They extended from the floor to the ceiling with a ladder on wheels to allow access to the top levels. There must be thousands of bottles in here, he thought. What if we, what if we only destroyed the, the drug lord samples? Surely you want El Patron. El Patron, said Dr. Evas, what if you should fall ill and need a transplant? You're the first clone who has ever lived beyond his 13th year, and we don't know whether there are any hidden weaknesses in you. Forgive me for using the word, me Patron. I'm a scientist, not a, not a diplomat. But please consider, when you were young, we tried to protect you against everything, and yet you still developed asthma and caught scarlet fever. I'll take my chances. There'll be no more clones. Me Patron, no more clones, shouted Matt. He almost walked out before realizing that he didn't know where he was. Which way is my room? I'd like to lie down. Of course, you can rest in the nursery. It's much closer. The doctor led Matt along the path by the fountain and the boy paused to let the breeze blow a fine spray over his face. This is so beautiful, he said. Why is it here? El Patron wanted statues of his brothers and sisters who had died, but of course, there were no pictures of them. He selected illegals for models from what he could remember. He used real children? Matt stepped out of the spray. The seven statues faced the center of the fountain. The girls were so small, they could not look over a window seal, not even if they stood on tiptoe. The five boys were larger and two of them the ones who had been beaten to death by the police were almost adults. They were filled with joy by the water that padded over their faces. Their hands were outstretched to hold this miracle that fell all year long, not just for two months in dry, dusty Durango. And the models, what happened to them?